Hello and welcome to the World Wanderers Podcast, your source for travel stories, travel destinations, and travel philosophy. I'm Amanda. I'm Ryan. And we're your hosts. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the podcast. We've got a really exciting episode for you today with Akaisha and Billy Catterley from Retire Early Lifestyle blog and website. And Akaisha and Billy retired when they were 38 years old back in 1991. So kind of following the recent pattern of talking to people who have retired early, it's something that we're really interested in and that we think is really cool to learn about. So we're talking to them about how they did it back before it was really popular. Well, I don't know if it's necessarily popular now. I think it's becoming more popular. Yeah, but before but- they were like the idea is becoming more well known. Yeah, and so we talk about you know what it was like for them to retire at the age of thirty eight, what life has been like kind of on the road for the last twenty five years, and kind of everything in between. Yeah, and kind of presents this alternate view to the idea of working traveling, spending all your money, working, traveling, spending all your money. Um, and just talking about the ideas of consistently saving and how savings and compounding interest really work for you over time. Um, but it's really interesting to hear their story as some, as people who have been traveling for such a long period of time, how that's evolved and how travel changes when you're going on your third decade. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It was really cool to hear about. So without further ado, here's Billy and Akaisha. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the podcast today. It's super cool to have you guys here and to be meeting you guys and hearing about your story of retiring early. Thank you you very much for having us. Yeah, of course. Did you want to start by telling us where in the world you're joining us from? We are currently in Lake Atitlan, Guatemala, and the town is called Panajeshel, Guatemala. We're on the shores of Lake Atitlan, one of the 10 most beautiful places in the world. Amazing. I think we might have to add that uh, that to our list of places to go in the future. <laughs> yeah, you won't be sorry. It's gorgeous here. And have you guys been in Guatemala for a while? Yeah, we've been here off and on for about the last five years. We uh, we tend to find a location that we like, and we, we base out of there, and then um, then we travel out of there. Like, for instance, in, the, in those last few years, we've been to Thailand, Vietnam, Dominican Republic, Panama, the U.S., um, Mexico. Okay. Wow. El Salvador. I said Vietnam. Oh, yeah. So, so we just kind of find bases. We we have a base here. We have one in Chapala, Mexico, which is just south of Guadalajara, and then we use Chiang Mai, Thailand, as a base as well. Wow. Yeah, that's really cool. <laughs> so, you guys have have you done like a quite extensive amount of Central America so far? Central America, yeah. Um, well, we've, we, we have done Mexico, which is not really Central America, but extensively, and then Guatemala extensively. Uh, El Salvador, it's easy to do in a, it's a small country, so we've been all over that country. But we have not done Nicaragua, Honduras, or Costa Rica. We did do Panama. And Dominican Republic. And Dominican Republic, but that's an island. Mm-hmm. Yeah, amazing. We're uh, Central America is kind of next on our our travel list, so we might have to hit you up outside of the podcast to get some some advice of places to go and whatnot. It's oh, a great sure. place to travel. Guatemala is a beautiful country. People yeah, are friendly. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty affordable down there too, isn't it? Yes, it is very much so. Amazing. Cool. Well, let's like back it up a little bit. I guess twenty five years to nineteen ninety one was when you guys retired early, correct? Yes. Amazing. And that seems like it was a little bit uncommon to retire early at that point. Yeah, it was a very uncommon idea back in 1991. We shook up um, everybody's world doing that, you know, being 38. And at that time of of life, um, 1991, you know, just nobody, nobody was ever doing anything like that. Um, There was, there was hardly anybody to mentor from. It was a completely different idea than anyone had and people thought we were being reckless. We, we lived in Santa Cruz, California, which is a, is a used to be a nice place to live and we were probably about 10 minutes from the beach, maybe eight by bicycle. Okay. And, uh, so we had a night, we were in a nice place. We owned a home, nice home, large lot. Um, financially we were doing, we were doing well. 
but it just something was missing. And Casey and I started drifting apart, and we just, um, you know, at one point we said something's got to change. We've got to do something different. And so we brought up um, just basically chucking everything, selling everything we had, and, and um, hitting the road. We we took a look at our finances, and we took a look at uh, more importantly, we looked at how much we were spending per year once we stripped out all of the cost of working. Mm-hmm. Um, we uh, dry cleaning bills, clothing, eating uh, out, cars, et cetera, et cetera. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, just eating out, transport your your clothes that you need for work. Mm-hmm. And those sorts of things, you know, we took out all those uh, costs of working and what would it cost us if we uh, pared down our house? And-, and then and then if we invested all the money from we, we were already invested in the financial markets. Um, but what if we added the added to it, the equity out of our home and you know, selling the cars and everything like this? And I penciled it out in the back of an envelope and said, you know, we can do this. Um, of course, I thought he was crazy. I, just, <laughs> I was definitely not ready for this at all. I was. My idea was that I'd retire at 55, you know, and somewhere in the middle there be a pillar of my community, be a support for my family, you know, have a, have a reputation worthy of, of myself. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, um, he, that's still yeah. early retirement in the U S too. Yeah. Technically. 55. Yeah. And so he comes up with this idea and, um, you know, I resisted it completely. I mean, I had my family there. We had a great home that I really loved and we were by the beach and, all of that. And so, but it took us, we took two years to uh, live on the amount of money that we thought we could without, um, you know, all these extra things like dry cleaning and gardeners and maids and this kind of stuff that we had. We were supporting that infrastructure and we found out that we actually could do this. And of course, Bill had worked on me and we made a list of all the things we wanted to do, places we wanted to see, things we wanted to learn. You know, so we made a vision that was appealing to both of us, and I eventually jumped on board, and we didn't tell anybody about it until right down to the last bit. Wow. Yeah, so it came as a shock to the people in our world, and they weren't happy about it. (laughs) So what was that like? You guys went for dinner with friends and were like, oh, yeah, like – we're actually going to sell all our stuff and start traveling indefinitely. <laughs> no, how, did no. that, how did those conversations go? Oh, no, it was, we, like I said, we didn't say anything up until the last couple of months. And then at that point it was, it was like, I asked my, we had a big garage sale, a big estate sale and sold everything. And, you know, I'm telling my parents, well, we're just going to travel the world. We're, you know, we're going to retire. There was no work like financial independence at that time. The only people that were financially independent were, um, sports stars and Bill Gates and musicians, you know what I'm saying? Uh, You had to have millions to be financially independent. So that wasn't really a word that was tossed around. And so we just threw in the idea that we were going to retire from our jobs. And Chris, my mom thought we were just crazy. And all of our friends thought we were going to be committing, you know, social suicide and stuff. But as we moved forward into having the estate sale and this kind of stuff, you know, they, some of them weren't happy about it at all and kind of isolated us and so on. But, you know, we were already on the train to go, you know, we were already on that moving yeah. idea moving forward. So in terms of going out to dinner and stuff, we didn't <laughs> have this conversation so much, you know, it was like they thought they, they would ask us how our vacation was going. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's something that I can sort of relate to. I know that my parents, as we as we go into this world of being travel blog bloggers and podcasters, and I'm a yoga teacher as well, my parents are like, "Oh, you're just like not doing anything." And I'm like, right. I'm, "I'm still doing stuff." <laughs> yeah, you know, just, we wake up in the morning with nothing to do, and at the end of the day, we've only got half of it done. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's how busy we are. We. uh you find things to do. It's just amazing how busy you can be. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I can relate to that. And so I think it's really interesting what you guys said about, um, not having the expenses of work. Mm -hmm. It's something that I feel like people don't think about. They think about, you know, Oh, well, if I'm going to go travel, I've got the expenses of, of travel, which is true. But when you're at home, you do have those expenses of work. You, if you work at a corporate job, you have to have a certain wardrobe for that. And you do, you've got dry cleaning and you've got a, there's certain drinks upkeep. after work and lunch yeah. if you're not making it. Right. It gets yeah, you can right. it's, it's so Thank easy God. to have your expenses expand to yes. m- meet everything. Yes. And you don't realize what that costs. We did a piece on our site called um our site's called retirelylifestyle.com. And if you 
if you look on the site, there's a search box. Look at the cost of working, and we we did a little piece on it to describe all the stuff that you're referring to. And you're right, people can easily overlook that. And you know, you get bored doing the same thing every day, every day, every day. So you do go out to lunch, you do buy a new outfit, you know, you look forward to playing golf on the weekends with some clients or. You know, I, I didn't have time to uh, clean my house, so I hired a maid. We had a large yard. We hired a gardening service, you know. So, like you were saying, Ryan, the expenses, just it, it, they just grow. They don't consider it so much. Yeah, and it's it's almost like the more money you have coming in, it's like unless you actively save that money, you just find that you can spend more. So it's like, oh, I, I can afford this extra luxury. Like, I can go get my hair done once a month or, you know, that's exactly. Something. Exactly. And it's an easy trap to fall into, especially in a consumer society. Yeah. And so how did you guys sort of hear about retiring early? Was it just something that you're like, I know you said that you you tried it for a couple of years before you fully committed, but was there somebody who did it before you where you were like, okay, somebody else is doing this? Well, I, when we said we tried it for a couple of years, we didn't try it for a couple of years. When we, when we made the break, we made the break clean. What okay. we did was we, we tracked our spending for a couple of years. Mm. And while, while we were working and we kept this very quiet, what we were doing, because we wanted to see how close we were, were how accurate we were with our finances. Okay. Gotcha. To, to, to see if we could do this. So, and in that two year period, you know, we had long discussions on how this was going to play out and how we were going to uh, let this unfold. Of course, none of it happened. But uh, it's just <laughs> you know, it's always how life goes. <laughs> it's, uh, it's how life goes. Exactly. I um, remember being in a doctor's office and picking up a, a very large magazine where some people were interviewed about going around the world with their children, leaving their job on, on uh, long term sabbaticals and this kind of thing. And, and we both read those articles and it got it got the uh, juices flowing. OK, That's so, the ways of living. You yes. saw people. People living on sailboats traveling around the world. Okay. Yeah. So you saw other people who were doing like longer term trips, taking sabbaticals right. from work and you're like, Hmm, maybe we could do something like this, but kind of even better. Yeah. Right. More permanently. Right. Yeah. So, so I'm really curious what the, the differences were or what the surprises were between what you were imagining life was going to be like when, when you made this move to what it was like in that first kind of year or so after taking off and selling everything. I I think there was an adjustment period. Um, at least there was for me, you know, we were both uh, very ambitious, hardworking. I mean, we were working 80 hours a week at one point easily. Wow. And um, so like when one stops that all of a sudden, you know, we, we exchanged like that purpose for, I don't want to say leisure, but it was leisure with a purpose. Like we studied languages, Billy learned how to play the saxophone and that kind of thing. And there was um, an adjustment period, you know, just I don't have to. We used to listen to the radio and listen to the traffic report and just kind of snicker and say, yeah, we're not in that traffic. You know? <laughs> or like the weather was really crappy in the town where we lived. Or Oh, no, we're on the beach now. This is really great. You know, we used to. But we were more attached to it took us a while to detach from our, our past life that we were living and we specifically went immediately to a Caribbean island called Nevis, uh, where we had been prior on some windjammer cruises. And so we we're familiar with the island, and we knew there that things were slow. Okay. And, I mean, like, if you want a cheeseburger, you'd better order it yesterday because that's how slow <laughs> things move. <on> wow. <laughs> so we, we purposefully went there so that we would hit a wall. Um, and not be tempted to jump into other things because because once we retired and once we started doing this, opportunities started springing up everywhere. And it was it's real easy to get involved with something um, that you may not want to. You're just going down the same chute again of, uh, of, of working and limiting your, your travel um, opportunities. And so we wanted to go someplace where where life was basically very, very slow. And we spent six months on that island basically detoxing. Wow, that's crazy. Detoxing from work, detoxing from, from stress, work, right. you know, yeah. just detoxing from that consumer life. Um, you know, we lived on an island uh, where the power would go off regularly during the day. Sometimes we didn't have running water. We were living in the mayor's brother's home, so it was one of the best homes on the island. But, you know, they, they use a cistern, and so, like, when the cistern runs dry, you know, there you are without water, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But um, so in terms of, like, what it was like for the first year and what we thought it might be. I think 
adjusting to the new lifestyle was not anything one can anticipate. You know, you just have to be able to have your list ready of things you want to do, learn and see and, and stay uh, flexible and stay flexible with it. And I think a year later, we just were so thrilled at, at how our lives opened up at all the things we could do that we, you know, we could go to bed late, go to bed early, get up early, eat lunch at three, eat lunch at 1130. I mean, we weren't on any kind of break. We didn't have to do. You know, we lost track of the days. The only time we ever knew it was Sunday, we called it Big Paper Day because that's the day that the comics came. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and uh, otherwise, we just lost track and we loved it and, and all the freedom, the personal freedom that we had. And um, that was tremendously surprising and, and fulfilling and wonderful. That sounds pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's one of the things I, I can really relate to from from the long-term travel we've had, it's kind of surprising how long it takes you to um, de-stress, like, like you said. Definitely. And, it, and it's not, you know, our life is not stress-free. I mean, uh, Acacia was just in the States, and um, and her flight got canceled coming back here. And I was I had to go to another town three hours away to pick her up. Oh, wow. And I get an email when I arrive that she's not coming. So. <laughs> but my bag went ahead without me. So my bag's in Central America. So and we're I'm wondering, if, oh, are we going to see the bag again? Are we not going to see it? Uh, oh, plan B, yikes. plan C, you know? Yeah, it's interesting when people haven't haven't traveled a lot, like if they've kind of only vacationed, I guess, and they've been on like resorts that are very luxurious and they kind of take care of you really well. And especially if you're traveling in more developing countries, like the countries in Central and South America and Southeast Asia as well, there's a lot of day-to-day challenges that happen. Sure. Exactly. Sure. You know, people, we run into people and say, oh, I've been to Mexico. I went to Cancun. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting. Nice. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because so I've technically been to Mexico four times, but I've only ever been for like I went with my family when I was younger. And so when people are like, "Have you been to Mexico?" I'm like, "Well, I have been, but I've never traveled Mexico." Like I've it's gone, a great country. Yeah, yeah, I've heard it's just fabulous. It's also on our list of places to go. But it is yeah, interesting. Food's awesome. Oh yeah, Mexican food is like probably our favorite. I think yeah. I could live off chips and guacamole if <laughs> <laughs> if I wouldn't get fat. <laughs> <laughs> and so you guys set out and you went to an island for 6 months and then you came out feeling detoxed, rested, relaxed. What was next for you? Okay, after <laughs> From, I told you we first discovered this island called Nevis via the Windjammer Cruises. Yeah. Well, when I when I was working, I was a, a stockbroker branch manager uh, for a brokerage firm in the West Coast of the United States, and um, and I managed the captain's money. Uh, that was the captain of all these ships, and so when we wanted to go south out of Nevis, the the Mandalay would dock the first Wednesday of every month in Nevis, and so I went down to the dock and I asked Paul. I said, "Can I catch a ride south with you?" Uh, down to Grenada, and he said, sure, you're going to have to sleep on deck. Well, we said, that's fine with us. That's not a problem because yeah. they've got nice mats up there. It's a 256-foot sailboat, so this is not a small boat. Yeah. Wow. And, um, you know, imagine like a football field. Yeah, that's um, really cool. And so so uh, we slept up on the deck for the first couple nights, and then after that, Paul came to us and said, look, I'm working 12 on and 12 off. You guys can stay in my cabin. So we end up staying in the captain's cabin. Um and uh, we just made it work. And then we, we so we sailed south to Grenada, and then we then we flew down into Venezuela, and hung out on an island there called Ile de Margarita, okay, uh, which was a which was a very fun hot hot spot at the time, and a happening place. Um, and then from there we we found our way back into the U.S. and we bought a a fifth wheel, a twenty eight foot fifth wheel trailer, and a one ton pickup truck. Okay, and cool. And we started traveling through the Western U.S. Uh, in this vehicle, in the in our in our fifth wheel trailer, and we took I don't know a couple of years to do that anyway. It's a great life. It's a great life because you have your home with you. You've got your own bed. You've got your own kitchen. You've got everything. But your your front yard changes all the time. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. I like the idea of kind of like having a movable home, and you can go. Like mm-hmm. you can just kind of transport yourself around the country. And so did you guys see like the entire U S while you were doing that? 
No, we we both have traveled uh, through the U.S. quite a bit previous, but we we concentrated on the Western U.S. We we went from uh, let's say we bought it in California, went to Arizona, spent time down in Arizona, and then we went to uh, a friend of ours was having a, a party up in Montana, so we we went up there and ended up spending the summer in Montana. Cool. Uh, in Whitefish, Montana, Flathead Lake area. Yeah. yeah. And and that's you know that's gorgeous country up there. Um, and then, and then we, uh, headed south. We, we went from there to the West Coast and, and, and just took about two months to drive down Highway 1, down the Pacific Coast Highway. And, uh, I believe we ended up back in Arizona and then we went to Texas and then we just well, traveled around. Some friends of ours invited us to go to Mexico and to, and to live in a town called Chapala. And they said they'd set us up with an apartment and some fresh water and get us started. And we both, talk to each other about how, you know, we should probably travel internationally for a while before we get too rigid and we aren't able to do it mentally or physically. We wouldn't be that flexible anymore. So we decided um, to to travel down to Mexico, you know, for a couple of months or so, and we ended up staying for four years. Wow. So, yeah, yeah. It just <laughs> life just happened, and it, we connected with it and got real involved in the community. Billy built some tennis courts for the city, and – you know, we ended up uh, living quite a bit of our lives in Mexico and, and um, keeping with the international travel. At, at about that point, I started taking care of my mom and dad through end-of-life care back in California. And Billy did some traveling, and he went to Asia with some friends. And when my parents passed on, he said, i got to take you to Asia. So then we started doing Asia and um, lived there for a while we started getting a lot more involved in medical tourism because you know we were not in the states we were getting all of our medical needs satisfied through foreign countries Mm -hmm. and we visited um asia for eight or nine or ten years or something like that and went back to mexico and found out about guatemala you know life just kind of evolved what we found is living in japan it was so easy for us to be there that we weren't traveling other places in mexico yeah so one of one of our times from asia we went back to mexico back to Chapala, and I said, look, let's not get settled. Let's just get get our gear, get down to some traveling gear, and let's travel this country. Oh, and, it's gorgeous. And so we made it a point to go all over Mexico as much as we could, um, sometimes two or three times. I think yeah. we've done five, five trips or so up the, up the uh, Pacific coast of Mexico. Oh, that's awesome. It's kind of interesting. I feel like we've heard from a couple of guests that we've had on the podcast of like having a short term plan for Mexico and then it's like just turned into this <laughs> longer term plan. Like it just seems a consistent thing with Mexico. It's a big country. It's a big country and it's gorgeous. You know, it has everything, mountains and little towns, big cities. It has culture. It's got beaches. It's got great food. It's got antiquities, you know, everything. It's fascinating. Yeah. And so you were mentioning medical travel. I'm kind of curious what sort of stuff you guys do with medical travel or medical tourism. Um, we do everything with okay. medical tourism. We've had, um, you know, the day-to-day stuff where you get your annual checkups and, um, you know, like, for instance, in Thailand, you can order, um, like, off a menu for a physical. And so you can, you know, you get your lungs checked, your blood work checked, your, your all of your x-rays. You can take... Um, have your internal organs checked. You can have a stress test for your heart and all that kind of stuff. And everything you want, you just check off in a box, and then the uh, price at the bottom changes according to what you add or subtract. It's all on a computer screen. It's all on a computer. Mm. We've had colonoscopies. We've had dental surgeries. We've had eyeglasses changed. Um, I almost lost my finger a few years ago, and I've had surgery on my finger and, and hyperbaric chambers. And Wow. Yeah, so it's been literally our whole, every, everything you can imagine, mammograms, everything, uh, emergency services, everything you can imagine we've done, uh, medical tourism because we live out of the country. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that holds a lot of people back from going out and exploring is this fear of like, what if something happens out, outside of exactly. the Exactly. Well, um, well, Keisha mentioned she almost lost her finger. I'll give you the quick synopsis of that. Yeah. We were we went out to lunch and had a, a real relaxing lunch. We were celebrating her birthday and had a bottle of wine and just just kicking back. And uh, and then we were house sitting outside of the town of Antigua, Guatemala, at the time. And so we took a what's called a, a chicken bus from the near the restaurant to um, back to our, the the neighborhood where we 
where we were at. And as Keisha was getting off the bus, she caught her rings on on a screw, on a piece of sheet metal, on something. We, we don't know what. Oh, yeah. And, and she, exactly. she stepped off the last step of the bus, and her entire weight ripped all of that tissue down to the uh, bone. Oh, my stomach just finger. flip-flopped. <laughs> yeah. It's called degloving. It happens uh, with athletes. It happens with soccer goalies. It happens with truck drivers. It happens more often than you can imagine. So she would, she actually cut an artery at the base of her finger, and she was bleeding out on the side of the, the road. Okay. Oh, my and, gosh. And so we grabbed what's called a tuk tuk and had them take us to a, a closest hospital, and they sutured her up this now, the hospital they took us to is not one that we would recommend. It's not one where we would go, but we, but Acacia's going into shock, and I just told the kid to get, me, get us to a hospital. And so so they sutured her up. They cleaned her up. But the next day and the day after, her finger was just turning black and cold. It was dying. Oh, wow. And so we got a hold of a, of a medical facilitator that we just happened to do an interview on for our website. And she made a few calls, and she got us into into Guatemala City to the best hand surgeon in the city. And he saw us that that same afternoon. And long story short, she had a, she had to go into a hyperbaric chamber for two weeks every day for two weeks for two hours. And we had to have a private driver out of Antigua that would that would take her to the city, stay with her all day, and bring her back. She had two surgeries on her hand, plus numerous other visits with the surgeon. The whole thing was about three thousand U.S. dollars. Wow. Wow. That's, that's like crazy. Crazy affordable. I um I yes, recently uh, had appendicitis and had to get my appendix removed. Um yikes. and we're we're Canadian, but I'm living in the US right now. Um so thankfully it was all covered by insurance, but just like seeing the price tag on it here in the US mm-hmm. is just crazy. Yes. <laughs> it's like it's Yeah. It's shocking. It's shocking. Like we always buy travel insurance when we travel just because like that's, you know, kind of what our parents taught us. And, you know, we were like, you never know what's going to happen. Like it's probably just worth it to spend a couple hundred dollars. But we've met so many travel travelers, especially in places like Southeast Asia and South America where they're on like a really, really, really low budget. And they're like, oh, no, I'm fine. And having... Ryan having appendicitis was this like crazy reminder that you should always have insurance in case something like that goes wrong. Yeah, uh, but but you could probably have it done in one of these countries for for you know much 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 less than what they're recording you in the states. Yeah, uh, Southeast Asia, Bangkok's got some of the, one of the best hospitals in the world. Yeah, and and so I have no hesitation going over there for. I've said for years the cheapest health insurance is a thousand dollar ticket to Bangkok. <laughs> <laughs> and so, do you guys are you guys still citizens of the U.S.? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, we're okay. not going to give that up. Okay. So, do you guys travel with insurance through? the u.s no okay no we do we do what's called go naked <laughs> so, so so anything the only time we carry insurance is when we are, are in the u.s because we are not yet 65 and once we hit 65 we will qualify for medicare okay and so we won't have to use use insurance in the states anymore so we get travels and traveler insurance when we visit family and friends in the States. And then otherwise we just pay out of pocket. Um, mm. like the incident with my finger with all that, um, all those surgeries, all that, all that, um, medicine, all that kind of stuff, the hyperbaric chamber, it was just $3,000. Okay. You know? so, yeah. And I guess that's probably for the amount of time that you have to use it. That's probably works out to be maybe a more like financially sound decision. And mm-hmm. Do you guys just make that decision based on sort of where you're traveling? Because I feel like if you were over in Europe, Europe would be quite expensive to pay out of pocket. Yeah, I, I don't know. We, well, we, we when we traveled in Europe in 1979, we did not have insurance. Okay. Um, so we didn't even think about it. But we were much younger at that point. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I some. I mean, Europe's got a socialized medicine, so something tells me if you got. If you needed emergency care, they'd put you in. Being Canadian, being a, being a citizen anywhere. Yeah. So for the Canadian insurance, it covered like the the your um, whatever province you're in, they'll cover the cost of what that would cost if you were there, um, okay. and then travel insurance really covers the extra. And that expires after something like if you're out of the province for six months, then um, then you right. lose that. But yeah, right. 
Right. We're familiar with a six month rule for Canadians. Yeah. Because uh, we've met enough of them in Mexico that have to go back. Yeah. Yeah. So wh- where was the idea for, or when was Retire Early Lifestyle born? Um, it, it was born in 2005, and that was about 15 years after we retired. Uh, the situation was in traveling and meeting people. People would ask us, you know, they first they'd get over the shock that we retired so young, and then um, we'd get in a conversation. They go, you know, you guys should write a book. And we're going, ah, come on, you know, who's going to buy a book from us? And no, no. And we, I mean, we heard it once. We heard it a hundred times that we should write a book. And so we decided that we needed to write a book. Um, and that was how the Adventures Guide to Early Retirement was born. And so then we, previous to that, we had a, a freebie website on what is now, what used to be called GeoCities. And um, the situation was, is that we, we started that to, to help our, our family and friends get a little better idea of what we were doing. And they started sending it to friends and it started crashing all the time because we had a real small bandwidth limit yeah. on it. And so then between the book and the website crashing, we felt like we had, we had something here that other people would be interested in. And so when we wrote the book, then we had to have a, a, a quote business website in order to handle the traffic. Mm-hmm. And, that was in uh, 2005. That was in 2005, correct. Okay. And so that was kind of like early into the, I guess, sort of like blog scene. Yeah. You know, um, when we retired, there was there was no personal computers. There were no um, uh, transfers of money electronically. There was no Skype. There was no email. There was no Facebook. There was no Instagram. There was none of that stuff. I mean, Snapchat. you know. Yeah, and there's none of that. You know, we would call on the phone back home and it'd be two dollars a minute from Mexico. So a half an hour phone call would be sixty bucks. Wow. We'd put money we'd put money on our charge cards ahead of time just so that we could charge things because by the time we received the bill it'd be two two months later. Um, you know, there was no I don't even remember how we used to get cash, but like ATMs. Well there was a there was ATMs, there but they were ATMs. sparse. They were sparse around, you know, and, and then as life progressed you know once people got we got our our uh, we had a computer when we ran our restaurant but once we got our personal computer that was in 97 98. 98 um you know we started going a lot more digital and you know our lives have changed completely because you know now there was email now there was electronic transfer of funds there was you know a lot more blogs that people were writing about this that and the other and hmm. you know um all that all that sort of thing and and um but that was before our website. I mean, if you can just imagine, I mean, there was no Skype or anything when we retired. The retire early lifestyle has just kind of been an organic, you know, an organic process. It's it's just kind of has evolved um, on its own. You yeah, know, we, we never were, we didn't sit down and say let's create a blog no. and sell books. No, that was okay. that was not what we did. We didn't have a business plan. We didn't have any plan. We didn't we didn't grow up with pushing buttons or anything. I mean, typewriters. You know, think about it. Think about it. Yeah. There was no, there was no keyboarding. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, today, today, you know, I here in here in Guatemala, here in Panayachel, Guatemala, there's there's a small community of digital nomads, and these guys are uh, uh, coders and website builders, website developers. Um, and I don't know what else they do, but um, you know, you can do it. They, they you put in a, a good line, uh, you know, some sort of decent bandwidth, and you you can do this. Yeah. It's really a lot more fun now. It's a lot easier now. Yeah. So, so would you say that it's um, – I'm curious, of, like, the changes you've seen in how traveling uh, is as an experience given that, like, there's more and more connectivity. Because it's something that's interesting. One of the cool things about travel is, like, maybe disconnecting um, mm-hmm. and having more mental space, like, really getting outside of your comfort zone. But now – you do have this ability to stay connected with people, which is amazing. But on some, in some ways, it also kind of gives you like a crutch to lean on. And yeah, every, everybody's got a device these days. You know, you see, you see people, you see tour groups come into town, and and they've all got their head planted in their phone, mm-hmm. and they're not they're not looking at what's around them. Um, to me, that that's just not right. Uh, I, I understand what you're saying. You know, there's so yin and yang. You've got to you got to have some sort of discipline to get away from it. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, where we are here, this is like the Mayan culture capital of the, of the world. And so we see 
old ladies walking down the street with a load of firewood on their head. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it just keeps us in check as to, as to what we, where we are at and how the different cultures around the world. When we first retired, one of the things was dealing with loneliness and not feeling like, um, you know, we had to in, develop internal connection. If you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, just speak through the heart to our family. You know, I used to, well, meditation and things, you know, well, you're a yoga teacher, you know about this stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so we, we developed that internal communication and we, uh, would speak with our families through our hearts and through meditation and, and be connected that way. And then of course we'd call on the phone and stuff. And then um, there were times that were lonely and, you know, letters were few and far between and, and that kind of thing. And visits back home, there was some disconnect in terms of like, if they wanted to buy us Christmas presents, like what could they buy us? We'd have to carry it, you know? So there was that type of disconnection. I mean, we just didn't want, you know, new China or new TV or, you know, we didn't, we didn't need those things that people in a regular society would need. And then, um, as the digital world grew, you know, that connection became so second nature. And I call my sister every week now for an hour or two on the, on Skype, you know, every week. And it's, it's lovely. And we get photos of the grandkids and the nieces and nephews and stuff on Facebook. And, yeah. And, and you're right, right. It does take some discipline not to uh, connect and to be. We like to go to these little villages where there's hardly running water and, you know, people are living in stilted houses. And here, like Billy was saying, the Mayan culture, this is, you know, where the Mayans lived in 5,000 years. You still see the culture very little changed, very little changed. They cook with wood. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the world could end tomorrow and the Mayans are going to go out and plant their corn and, and harvest mm-hmm. their corn and make tortillas. And cook, with, cook yeah. with wood. And do their natural medicines and have yes. the children and drink out of the lake. And- yeah. It's pretty spectacular that there's still cultures who are really living off the land and who can really fend for themselves. Because I feel like in North America, we just don't do that. Mm-hmm. If the cell phone towers go out, people will be frozen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> totally. I mean, we're down in Atlanta, Georgia, and I was talking to somebody the other day who was like, how did people get around Atlanta before GPS? And I was like... <laughs> <laughs> like it is such a complicated, crazy big city, and I was like, I actually don't know. Like it sounds it's called so a map. <laughs> yeah, it's like map reading skills are a, a whole other thing that millennials are just <laughs> not really <laughs> don't really know how to do. But oh, it's the world's of- changed. The world is changing fast, Amanda. We we have discussions about this all the time, and um, uh, you know, our when we meet millennials. Backpackers come through here because this is a popular uh, destination for backpackers. And, uh, you know, I try to get in conversations with them about finances and and if they're doing anything for their future. And nine out of ten of them have a clue what I'm talking about. Yeah. You know, I try to emphasize how important it is for to get started now because they've got something that we don't have, and that is time. And the compounding of money over time is the greatest asset you can have. It's we just, always try to tell them. Oh, sorry, Ryan. Oh, I was just going to ask, like, what are the what are the, like the big th- things that people who are young should know about finances? Save as much as you can and invest it into an index uh, index ETF like SPY. That's a spider. It's the uh, S and P five hundred index ETF or. Um, BTI, which is the Vanguard Total Market Index, where you own like 5,000 stocks. Um, and to save as soon as possible, because like Billy was saying, uh, millennials have time, and the, the money value of time is incredible. We call it making your own money machine. And you can find an article on our on our website called um, Create a Money Machine. Create a Money Machine. And that's something that millennials can do that, that – our money machine has been working for us since 19, well, since we were working, but in the 1900s, 1990s, but um, <laughs> in the 1900s. <laughs> yeah, we're you a little know, older. You know, I, I have often said that the best thing a, a, a couple with a newborn could do is to deposit, is to deposit $10,000 into the S&P 500 on the day they're born and forget about it. A child's going to be set. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really a good reminder. And I know it's something that has been more 
something that we're thinking about lately because when we first started traveling, it was kind of this like, okay, we're going to work really hard. We're going to save up a bunch of money. We're going to go travel for a bit and have like a really awesome experience and then come back and there's no money left. So it's like, we have to go back to work. And we did that twice and we're like, there has to be a different way because this isn't sustainable forever. Right. Yeah, and that's so, you, so you create. Excuse me, Ryan, but to create a you create investments that kick off enough income or growth and in income combined, or that you can pull up enough money to live on, and meanwhile your nut keeps growing. Mm-hmm. And so over time, over inflation, your nut outperforms inflation, outperforms your spending, and so your assets, your net worth continues to grow. Yeah, that's really a smart way to think about it for sure. And I think that it's, you know, we have a lot of people between like sort of 25 and 35 that listen to the podcast. And I think it's, it's really good for them, especially if they, you know, want to travel, want to have children, want to have more freedom as they get older. Sure. Invest as early as you can is get it started as early as you can and invest as much as you can as early as you can because the time, the time, the compounding of time and interest. Is it's like the eighth wonder of the favor. world. It's in your favor. We have more money now than we did when we retired, and that's after twenty five years of living and traveling. That's incredible. That's really cool yeah. to hear. Yeah. And think, inflation. Yeah, because it's something that people. I feel like they kind of maybe think in their head, they're like, oh, well, you've like, you know, you've retired early, but, you know, how are you going to continue doing this? How are you going to keep this sustainable for the next however many years of your life? Correct. And so that's something we thought about before we did it. Mm-hmm. And that's that's part of the reason we took a two year plan to uh, two years prior to to get our finances in order to create this uh, this this machine that was going to churn out fun tickets is what we call them. And, <laughs> and so, you know, when you got more fun tickets and you can spend, it's a good it's a good feeling. Yeah. And it's it's funny because um, we've been doing we've done a few interviews lately with people who have done extreme saving to finance early retirement. Um, and it is just an idea that is like, it's, it's something that it's a surprisingly uncommon to hear about. Um, Mm -hmm. and like when you're thinking about like as a teenager and you're thinking about what my life is going to look like, I feel like the average person is like, well, you know, college, get a job, work the job until I'm in my sixties and then retirement. Like that's what that is. Except that today, Ryan, you're, you're probably going to work five or six jobs. Yeah. Because, because the companies don't hire people like they did back for you when your parents' age and my parents' age. You know, to work for the same company for 30 years is, is, I don't believe that's going to be the case anymore. Yeah. But so you have this like work phase, but I think the thing that's, um, it's just, it's funny that you can, if you were like really aggressive about saving money and, investing that money, um, in a non risky and dumb fashion, it really doesn't take that long to be able to, to finance a life where you can, um, support yourself if you're living minimally, um, exactly. just doing what you want. And it's, it's funny how uncommon that, that knowledge is. A real basic nutshell thing as I use is, is if you could make 10% to, for easy math, if you could make 10% and you had a hundred thousand, that's $10,000 a year. Yeah. So if you if you can live on eight thousand, then you've got two going back in, so now you've got one hundred and two thousand, yeah. and that's going to throw off more, and then that throws off more. So you know you just got to kind of figure it out that way. But the first thing to do is to find out how much you're spending per year, and then if you know what you, what your nut is, then multiply that times twenty five, and that'll give you a pretty good idea of how much you need to have invested to okay. throw off that that sort of income. Yeah, that's really interesting. That's a, a good way to think about it. I feel like that's great advice for us and for people listening, I'm sure. Good. So what do you think? I'm sure you guys counter, encounter a lot of objections online. Where, that worked for you, but it won't work for me, kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure. You get that. You sure. get that. Yeah, we're, you know, we were lucky because we rode the, we rode the stock market uh, wave in the 90s. That's what they, we get that. We used to get that until everything crashed in 2000. Yeah. You know, what do you and think then again it, in 2008. What do you think it is about the idea of early retirement that makes uh, some people so uncomfortable? I think some people don't know what to do with their time. I, I think a lot of people like the comfort of a job and a routine and getting a paycheck. And, and you know, they take the same way to work. They go to the same grocery stores. They, you know, they like a routine. They like that safety net. They, they like 
you know, the pattern and the comfort and to think out of that box is really scary for probably most people. They identify themselves with their jobs. Right. And, and people, um, self-discipline, you know, to, to create your own life of your own choosing takes some creativity and self-discipline. And I think it's just easier to sit back and maybe do a job, maybe not do it all that great, but you always get your paycheck. But if you're relying on yourself and, you want to create your own life. It, it does take that focus and self-determination. And, and I don't think that is as appealing to as many people. You know, it's, it's a personality difference. I mean, at least that's what I would think. The comfort of the pattern is something that's far uh, more appealing to a lot of people. You know, when you meet somebody new up north, um, usually one of the first questions is, what do you do for a living? What do you do? Yeah. Well, in, these, in these Latin countries, they say, what do you do for fun? <laughs> yeah. I mean, everybody has to work. They don't want to hear about it. You know, they want to know what you're doing for fun. Yeah, it's such an interesting way to look at it. And it's it's been really cool for us as we've traveled different places around the world to really see outside of the way that we are in North America, Canada, and the U.S. and see mm-hmm. this different mentality around. It's not all about this this job status. It's you know, if you're like, oh, I'm this big time person who works 80 hours a week, like somebody in Latin America is like, I, I don't really care. Yeah. Why right. would you do that? Yeah. <laughs> like that seems, well, that doesn't okay, seem fun. It's okay to do that. It's okay to do that if you sock away as much as you can to free yourself from that. Yeah. To have a plan, exit plan. You know, like Ryan was saying, people, people, younger people today, they, they think, well, I'm going to work for the next 30 or 40 years and I'm going to retire. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the 30 or 40 year plan is. It's a plan, but it's not a very good one. You know, you need to have like a three and a five year plan. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind so of it's, interesting too. It's like, I don't like, why would you want to waste the years of your life when you're young and to, to wait till you're 65 to go explore when you're like, you can't hike big mountains or, exactly. you know, you don't feel comfortable going to Asia because you're not as agile. You're not as young and jumping sort of, in the back of an open pickup truck and riding standing up. Yeah, yeah, or hopping on a moped just doesn't seem like right. a, a great idea yep. when you're 65, yep. 70 years old. Exactly. So why do you think that um, financial independence or early retirement is not uh, is such an uncommon idea? Why do you think that your generation um, doesn't think about that as much? That's a really good question, and I think that I think that you summed it up very well. I think there's part of it that is people do really define themselves by their jobs and especially where we live, like in the U S up in Canada, we experience the same thing. It is the first question is what do you do? And Mm -hmm. I find that, so we both quit our corporate jobs. Ryan's been working um, not for profit down in Atlanta, but I don't have a work visa down in Atlanta, so I can't work. So I'm a podcast host. I'm a yoga teacher. I'm Mm -hmm. a writer. It's more entrepreneurial. I work online and some people find that really intriguing and they find it really interesting and other people kind of just look at me like I'm crazy. Mm-hmm. So that's been a really interesting experience for me. And I think people really do like, they're like, Oh, you don't care that you're not making X dollars a year and working for this company. I'm like, no, I'm way happier like this. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, that's important. Yeah. And I think that the, the, the knowledge of how compounding interest works, which is like, I mean, I think people understand it kind of, but it, fi- basic financial skills, really a lot of people don't learn. Um, right. And that's kind of like foundational to learn like, oh, if I make a hundred, if I have a hundred thousand dollars and I can get 10% from it, I get $10,000 every year. And yeah. then exactly. if I spend less than that, it keeps growing and growing and growing. I remember exactly. seeing uh, uh, a table in a book of like what it looks like. I can't remember what the amounts were like. If ten thousand dollars over forty years at five percent interest compounding, and the number at the end is just like amazingly well, large, yeah. And yeah. It's, it's funny because you you know it abstractly, but I feel like it's something that people struggle to actually think about. Right. Um, try try to take an Excel spreadsheet and put ten thousand dollars into the first column, and multiply that times one uh, percent uh, um, per month. What would be twelve percent? This you're stretching things now a little bit trying to get 12%, but, um, just for, just for the fun. And then add a thousand dollars a month to it. And you'd be shocked how much in 30 years that's going to be worth. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, it's really interesting because we both have business degrees. Ryan majored in finance. So, and I had to take finance classes and he showed me that what he was just saying with the compounding interest. And like, I understand what compounding interest is, but I've never been taught this as something that I should personally do with my own finances other than the basic, um, we, we have like, registered retirement plans and sure. savings plans. Like I have money invested for my future, but not in a way that it's compounding mm-hmm. so well. And he showed me that and I was like, what? Really? Yeah, is this right. real? Like this seems like, why is not, why is everybody not doing this? If this works? Because they don't understand it. That's why. Right. And, and we, our education system has failed. To, to teach self-sufficiency to people, finan- financial self-sufficiency. Totally. Yeah. I was, that was the next thing I was going to say. I was like, you know, the public school system doesn't teach you any of that. They, no. you, you just come out of school knowing what you know, you know what your parents knew. And for the most part, it's just like, that's what happens in society. And so you just continue doing this thing without having any idea that there's something different that you could be doing. Yeah. And then exactly. also the, um, the index fund thing, like the stock market seems to be like so, so overly complex in the way it's presented to people. Like you look on the news and it's like, Oh God, what's happening here? Um, mm-hmm. but the, then it's just like, Oh, instead of trying to like having to figure out this like infinitely complex thing, you can just like buy everything. That's right. It's, it's simple, you buy the whole market and then you don't care. And, the, and that the, I think people struggle to see, um, that, that as a, not a zero sum thing where it's like the market will grow over time just because of innovation and progress, unless something um, drastic happens and changes well, that direction. Yeah, it does. It, things do happen drastically. And, um, uh, you know, you just have to know, you have to be confident enough in yourself that say the world's not going to come to an end. The, the, the New York stock exchange has been in business for over a hundred years. It goes back into the 1800s. Yeah. And so, you know, Exxon has been around for over a hundred years. They've weathered a lot of storms. Um, you know, and then you've got the newbies like even Apple. Apple's within the last 20 years or so has come about. And Google. And you never know. We don't know what the future is going to bring, where the next innovation is going to happen. And, and so, you know, if you, if you own the entire market, you're going to participate in that. Yeah. And you said that you guys have gone through two sort of recessions in the 2000s, early mm-hmm. 2000s. Were those like pretty frightening moments for you to know that you've got a lot of money invested there? Um, well, I was in the business and so I got a thick skin about it, but it definitely, um, you know, when you see your net worth drop in half, it, um, it's time to take a look at things, mm-hmm. but that's the wrong time to be making any changes. Yeah. Because as soon as you make changes, the market's going to turn around and come back. You know, since the, since the lows of 2008, the, I don't know, the S&P's up a couple hundred percent. Wow. Uh, so, you know, if you're fortunate to start investing in 08, you're, you're doing great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I've heard more and more over the last couple of years where it's like, you know, the market crashes, invest your money then because it's always going to go back up. Right, right, right. But um, the better thing is to just do it every month and not try to time it. That yeah. way, you, that way you, you just don't, don't have to spend your time monitoring what's going on. And, and that way you can just, uh, it, it'll just compound and it'll start working for you. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting. And it's, it's cool to hear more about that. Um, I'm, cu- I'm curious, obviously travel is amazing, but there's always kind of like low points. Have you guys had sort of some, some cons to, I guess, retiring early or, or low points over the last 25 years since you've retired early? Um, I don't think I would call any low points um, because we've retired early or, I mean, like the kind of things I would call low points is when we go to a country and it doesn't suit our climate desires. You know, if we hit a, a weather pattern of rain for like three weeks, then we just don't do rain. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, or, um, you know, if one of us gets ill because we drank some water or, or something like ate some food or something and, and we don't feel good. I mean, it's, it's just never fun when you or your partner is down sick and you have to stay in the hotel room or something like that. But, but actually our, our retirement has just been fabulous from the point of view of all the things we've learned, the people we've met, the freedom that we have, that, that has always been our driving force. And, you know, we can come and go and do and learn and 
see anything we want. And it's that's what just drives us to continue doing this lifestyle. We keep thinking we'll settle down some at some point. Um, but there's always something else around the bend that we want to see and do and learn and grow. And so, um, you know, I, I, I might be missing something, but I don't you know. Really you know, some people could say that uh, when our parents passed away, it was a low point for us. That has nothing but, to do with retirement. But no, I understand that. Uh-huh. But, what, but what we did do is we were able to offer them end-of-life care. Yeah, and, and that was really special. Um, so we would wait that as being a, you know, an opportunity that we would never have had had we been working. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I like the way that you phrase that, where it's like, you know, even in the times where you're sick or the weather's bad, it's like uncomfortable, but it's never like, like life is is bad as a whole. It's just like, no. you know, it's like a new place that we need to go, or you know, we've been sick before, <laughs> we know we'll be better, and that sort of thing. Correct. Right. You know, you know, back to the medical tourism thing, you know, I always remind people that, you know, everybody around the world's got two arms and two legs, most people. Yeah. And, and a heart and a stomach and a head and brain. And, you know, there's doctors all over the world that have seen this stuff before. Mm-hmm. So it's not just in Canada and the U.S. where we're, we're so special that, that uh, you know, you're the only one that's had a broken arm. Yeah, that's a good way to think about it because I feel like there is kind of this, like, idea that you can't get – is good for medical care. It's not going to be sanitary. And, you know, there's definite times where you need to be aware of those things, but it is remembering that, you know, a doctor in Argentina is still dealing with, you know, the same, the same arm, thing. the same bone structure as a doctor is in the United mm-hmm. States. Exactly. Right. And a lot of doctors in the U S actually graduate out of Guadalajara, oh, uh, the medical schools, of Guadalajara, because yeah, they can't get in the States. Yeah, and it's so expensive too. I know I have a friend who's yes. gone down to Mexico to get some dental work done. She needed to get like a she's got a space in her in her mouth where a tooth just didn't grow, and she's had that entire process done in Mexico because there's no way of getting that entire process covered up in Canada, and it's thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. And she's getting it done with the United States, like he's a U.S. doctor working in Mexico. There you mm-hmm. go. Yeah. Excellent. I was like, that's really cool. Yeah, we want to be respectful of your time, guys. Um, we really appreciate you coming on to talk to us, though. Um, where should people go to find more about you? RetireEarlyLifestyle.com is our website. And uh, we have a link on there to uh, sign up for our free newsletter. And you can contact us with any questions you have. We answer all of our mail. Amazing. Uh, it's been yeah, we love we we love hearing from younger kids. We love knowing that. Listen to me, I'm calling you a kid, but you know, we love <laughs> we love hearing from you know that really makes me feel wonderful about the future that you know millennials want to know and grow and grow their finances. That's just awesome. Our, my mission is is to try to teach as many people as I can to become financially independent. It's a great thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah just going the other way, I think like when we we heard about your website through uh, Jeremy from Go Curry Cracker, who came on our podcast and checking out what you're doing. I love that you guys are so adventurous and you're just willing oh, to you. travel the world and explore. I think that it's really cool. Thank you. Yeah. You know, what? once you become financially independent, it doesn't mean you, it means you can still work if you want to, but you don't have to. Yeah. Yeah. We talked to a girl who's pretty, yeah, who's in her thirties who just retired. And, um, she was saying, she's like, it's not that I'm never going to work a job for money ever again. That's not what it is. She's like, I'm just not doing this career thing where I'm stuck at a job for X amount of years to try and make ends meet. Right. And I I was like, I kind of love that because it's not like you're limiting yourself to the things that you can do. You're really opening yourself up to all the things that are out there that you want to do. Exactly. exactly. It's like a, it's like a weight's taken off of your shoulders. And totally. so, you know, if you don't like what, if you don't like something, you leave, you try something new. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you guys. Thank, thank you very you much. So we much. appreciate Both you having you us on. Ryan. Thank you. Oh, thank of you. course. To find more information, relevant links and photos talked about in this week's episode, check out the worldwanderers.com. If you have a question, comment, or feedback, send us an email at info at theworldwanderers.com. Join our community on Facebook at The World Wanders or on Twitter at World Wanders 1. As always, thanks so much for listening. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.